Welcome to lecture 5. So today we will do a slightly more complicated programming language um, for which <coughs> there is also a compiler. Uh, but before that let us uh, briefly summarize what we did last time uh, and also answer the question. So we will follow more or less the same abstraction levels except that this brown I will change. Uh, so programs and commands and atomic commands and a context free grammar notation will remain the same. Um, so let us look at last time's grammar. Uh, we had this grammar, firstly the grammar of programs was that every program is just a command, a command could either be some atomic command uh, or it could be a sequence of commands or it could be a conditional with an if b then c else c phi where the uh, where all these words in black are reserved words so including this which you may not have seen uh, it acts as a closing bracket for the if and similarly the odd here it acts as a closing bracket for the do uh, okay so one of the things i said was so, so uh, uh, we also defined the notion of ambiguity for example we saw that this grammar uh, so for example we asked the questions whether this given grammar was ambiguous so as i said a grammar is ambiguous if there exists a sentence in the language generated with more than one parse tree it's implicit that if there is if a grammar is ambiguous, not only will its parse tree be, uh, not only will there be a sentence with more than one parse tree, the same sentence will also have more than one abstract syntax tree because the abstract syntax tree is just obtained from the parse tree by elevating the operators to the root nodes and, re and replacing the non-terminal symbols by the appropriate operators, yeah. Uh, that is for a restricted class of uh, parse trees. Okay. So the question was uh, how this grammar is ambiguous and actually by in the case of these two control structures the conditional and the loop uh, I have eliminated the ambiguity by introducing two new reserved words the closing bracket words phi and odd. However this sequential composition or the sequencing operator which is a binary operator on commands actually gives you ambiguity. So uh, let us see how that happens. So for example you could have uh, you could have three commands. So let us assume you have C1 semicolon C2 semicolon C3. These three are either atomic or compound commands I do not care but these three commands actually have give you two different parse trees. So you could for example you could have a parse tree like this I am drawing triangles here to denote that these C3, uh, these, these various commands themselves can expand into trees. So this is a, a tree in which this first, this first semicolon is the root and the second semicolon is the right subtree, is the root of the right subtree. Right. Another possible uh, parsing of this is is the following. You could have a semicolon C one C two. C3 in which case in which case this the first semicolon is actually here 
it forms the root of the left subtree and the second semicolon is the root of the tree. So strictly speaking there is ambiguity in this grammar but uh, what we will see and what is obvious actually to anybody who has done some programming is that the sequencing operation in any programming language is uh, associative in the sense that it so this this really these two trees really correspond to different bracketings right so for a, so th this tree for example corresponds to the bracketing where you have c2 and c3 bracketed inside and c1 and c3 bracketed inside outside and this tree corresponds to the case where you have C1 and C2 bracketed inside and then C3 bracketed outside, right. So, so this corresponds to C1 semicolon C2, the whole thing semicolon C3 and this corresponds to C1 semicolon C2 semicolon C3, right. But uh, since in general uh, the sequencing operation as we will see later in the semantics is really a function composition operation and the function composition itself is associative, we will see that sequencing is also associative. So what it means is that as far as the implementation of the language is concerned, a a any implementation can take any decision with regard to the semicolon operation. So the fact that it is ambiguous does not matter as far as the runtime behavior or the meaning of programs is concerned yeah so so that's a, that's a small matter which um, we have disposed of but in other cases things can sh change as we saw we saw an example of boolean expressions where there was ambiguity if you did not introduce parenthesis and uh, it can actually change the value of the boolean expression depending upon how you parse the boolean expression right so so let's look at uh, how if you were to actually look at a language reference manual uh, what would it uh, what would it look like so uh, we have so most languages since algol 60 use a notation called the bacchus nor form okay uh, it's actually a notation uh, created by john bacchus and peter nor in the definition of ALGOL 60, the ALGOL 60 report was the first uh, language which used a rigorous syntactic form based on context free languages and context free grammars to define the, the language abs accurately. Before that, for example, uh, uh, Bacchus was involved in the creation of Fortran and uh, the net result was that uh, since there was no clear syntactic definition of the, of the Fortran language, every Fortran compiler written by various people gave different interpretations to the syntax of Fortran and what, what that resulted in was that Fortran, com, uh, Fortran programs were not compatible across machines. So for example, the way one compiler treated uh, the Fortran syntax was different from, uh, from another compiler. And moving programs from one from one machine or one compiler to another compiler became a huge problem. It became a huge problem in the sense that you required a whole team of programmers to actually either entirely rewrite that program to suit the new compiler or the new <coughs> architecture of the machine or it required substantial rewriting and, uh, and uh, uh, patching up of programs so that they would run correctly in the new, on the new machine or on the new compiler okay so so by that time of course context free grammars had become quite popular as a form of theoretical study and Bacchus and Nor defined the algol 60 language using this notation um, they were well the as far as as far as we are concerned what they used was for to ensure readability they did not use non terminal symbols uh, uh, I mean they did not use single symbol, uh, single character non-terminal symbols, they used full words. So they wrote statement within angle brackets 
and uh, since there was no arrow mark on the typewriter they used a double colon equals which has now become standard okay and uh, so they wrote all the productions in this form in full with the non terminals being enclosed in angle brackets and the arrow being replaced by double colon equals but actually what 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 is more convenient and uh, which which came up very soon is what is known as the extended bacchus nor form okay uh, the extended bacchus nor form uh, it just adds the power of specifying regular expressions within context free in a convenient fashion that is that's all it is merely a convenience uh, we should remember that uh, firstly regular expressions are also context free but what happens is that there are many constructs which for example allow for options or zero or more occurrences uh, and and uh, in order to specify them by a context free grammar uh, with the limited notation that we have uh, what it means is the introduction of new non terminal symbols to allow for those kinds of iterations. So, the extended Bacchus nor form essentially uh, uses the Bacchus nor form extended to include iterations in choice. So, for example, so here you have one thing. So, let us let us look at this. So, supposing you had a Bacchus nor form production of this form. Okay where alpha, beta and gamma are strings of terminals or non-terminals. Okay. So, if you had a production of this form A goes to alpha, uh, note that as usual I am using my uh, light brown brackets for the, for the, for the notation, for the Bacchus nor form notation or for the context free grammar notation. Yeah. So, this would be equivalent to the two productions A goes to alpha B gamma where B is a new non terminal symbol which is not already there in your set of non terminals and B either goes to epsilon or to beta right. So, this just says uh, this is something this notation the extended Bacchus nor form notation is something that you will see you will see quite often for example. Uh, on any Unix machine if you run the man pages for some command. So, you will find that there are various options given switches given and they are usually separated uh, they, they are usually enclosed in brackets of one kind or the other. Normally, they use square brackets to represent the various options. So, a typical example was would be that for example, uh, for if you had more than one option as in this case. Those, the two options, the several options are either separated by bars or they are separated by commas and uh, what it means is that you this is equivalent to this, this set of productions with a new non terminal symbol. And since in the definition of a programming language you do not want to clutter it up with new non terminal symbols which do not have any particular significance okay, except that they aid in writing out a grammar more systematically. If they do not have any logical significance, you would not like to introduce them, right. So, so for example, uh, so, so uh, if, if you had the option of having an, uh, if, if in a language like Pascal, you allowed both statements, uh, both the if then statement and the if then else statement, then the else clause is an option, okay, which could be, which ideally could be sep separated out, but then the else clause actually belongs with the if and the then as a logical as a grammatical entity. So, you would not like to separate it and uh, so what you would do is you would put that else clause in the definition of your language. If your language allowed an else clause and a normal one arm conditional like if then, you would put the else clause within these square brackets right. So, so that it, it uh, so that you reduce the amount of uh, the number of non terminal symbols. Remember that a programming language, a real uh, world programming language which is actually being used is actually quite a large piece of uh, syntax by itself without, without actually complicating it further 
by adding these extra non-terminals which do not have any particular significance. Yeah? So, which have significance for the compiler, which have significance for accurately specifying the language, but otherwise do not have grammatical significance. Yeah? So, <coughs> which have significance for example, with respect to ambiguity, parsing and so on and so forth, but do not have, do not as a logical entity have a separate significance from the non-terminal in which they are actually specified as an option. Right. So, um, the other thing is that is that you can have 0 or more repetitions of some option. So, if you were to have a production of this form a goes to alpha within braces beta gamma, then this is equivalent to saying that you have two productions of the form a goes to alpha b gamma, where b is a new non-terminal and b is this denotes uh, 0 or more repetitions of the string b in your production of the string beta. So, b either goes to epsilon which denotes a 0 number of it, uh, number of repetitions or it goes to beta b. So, that you could you could have more than one occurrence of a beta right. <coughs> so, so this is what this is the extended BNF uh, notation which is normally used. The extended BNF notation is also very convenient for other practical reasons. For example, um, <coughs> if you look at any Pascal manual, the syntax diagrams of Pascal can be <coughs> are directly equivalent to the extended BNF notation. So, you just have to follow the arrow marks in the syntax diagram and they actually give you the productions. Okay, and they correspond more to the extended BNF notation than to the ordinary context-free grammar notation that we have already seen. So, for uh, so it's 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 important to know this for <coughs> sorry for reading manuals, for learning a new language, and also for maybe and and in general to know about the language. Right. So let's let's look at. Uh, a language. The last time we looked at a toy language which did not even exist. So, let us look at now, uh, look now at a language which actually does exist. Um, so, this is the language PL0. Uh, this language is very much Pascal like, it was designed for the purposes of teaching programming languages, compilers, and so on as a first course by Nicholas Wirth himself, the designer of Pascal. He has also written the compiler. Uh, which is available with us. Uh, so, the the main thing about PL0 is that it is even smaller than Pascal. It has a single data type, the main features are that it has a single data type called in of integers and nothing else, no other data types. Um, the only control structures are that are assignment, a sequencing, bracketing, looping and a one arm conditional that means it has an if then statement there is no if then else it's just there's just an if then statement uh, you, you can program an if then else as two one arm conditionals in sequence right where you can negate the boolean uh, of course there are no boolean data types in this what it means is that you'll have to encode your booleans maybe as integers okay maybe use zero for false and 1 or anything greater than 0 or true. Okay. So, um, and but it does contain one important feature and that is a control abstraction mechanism. So, it actually contains uh, parameterless procedures which uh, allow for uh, a stepwise refinement of programs which allow for an abstraction of uh, which which allow for complicated programs to be written in a structured fashion and uh, it allows these parameterless procedures also be to, to be nested. Okay, so, you can have a nesting, so which allows for a stepwise refinement in the development of programs. Uh, so, let us let us look at the syntax of PL0, uh, let us look at a, so I, I will uh, I will keep using the arrow mark instead of the double colon equals for a production, but I will use the extended BNF notation otherwise. 
right. <coughs> so let us define it in a top down fashion. So a program, uh, my start symbol is P in this case. I will not explicitly specify <coughs> the terminal symbols and the non terminal symbols. <coughs> I am sorry. Uh, I will not explicitly specify the terminals and the non terminals. It is obvious that the terminal symbols are those that are colored black and the non terminal symbols are other, others. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the start symbol, however, is P. Uh, so a PL0 program is a, is a block which terminates with a dot with a period. This is as in as in the case of Pascal programs you terminate the program with a dot right. A block consists of a, a declaration followed by a statement. I am saying a declaration and a statement uh, we will we'll see that. So a declaration uh, and uh, also for brevity I do not write uh, full names for the non terminals i have tried to use non terminals so i have tried to use single uh, single letter non terminal symbols which are sort of obvious what they mean so a declaration d uh, can be this clause is optional since it's enclosed in light brown brackets so you can have a constant declaration Okay, a constant declaration, which means that so this word const is a reserved word. Okay, and a constant declaration is I have put these in dark brown i and n. They stand for identifier and number, which we'll look at later. The reason I have put them in dark brown is because they're not really non-terminals. I mean, there are there could be an infinite set of identifiers possible. And uh, of course, an infinite set of numbers. We are considering an ideal machine for which we are specifying the syntax. The actual limits on the numbers and the lengths of identifiers is going to be implementation dependent, right? That is not part of the syntax definition of the language, right? So, so the, they are not really non-terminals. They are actually terminals, but then there are an infinite number of them possible. So, I'll we'll define them also. But uh, for the present, just take this light, uh, this dark brown i and n at face value as identifiers, uh, that is names and uh, numbers. Since we have only integers, those are the only kinds of uh, data type we have. Uh, and uh, of course, they, you could have a number of constants specified separated by commas. So the comma is a reserved word of this language. And this, the moment a wor the word const occurs, there has to be at least one constant definition. Okay, so this combination specifies one or more occurrences of the clause i equals n. This also specifies how they should be separated. They should be separated by a comma. If there is a const reserved word, it should be it should be terminated by a semicolon. So, in a, so you can define a sequence of constants in a single declaration and terminate that sequence of constants, uh, the, terminate the entire declaration by a semicolon. And of course, you do not need to have any constants at all. So, this, this entire clause is optional. Okay. Now, whether you have any constant declarations or not, you could have variable declarations, but you do not need to. So, even that clause is optional and since there is only one kind of a data type, it is not necessary to explicitly specify what the variables are going to be of. So, you can just specify the variables separated by commas, but the moment and you and the moment you have this reserved word var occurring, you have to have at least one identifier. If you have more, they should be separated by commas. And if you have this var, the entire variable declaration will have to be terminated by a semicolon. Okay, so this is also optional. You could have procedure declarations and they are parameterless procedures. 
and a procedure has a procedure uh, has procedure as a res reserved word there should be an identifier which should be terminated by a semicolon and there should be a block which is again terminated by a semicolon and the entire entire procedure is also optional you do not need to have any procedures in your program and whether you have one or more of these clauses they should occur in this order and you have a statement. So, oh I should have I should not have written this sorry let us erase this we are just considering declarations so this. So, declarations end here and of course, the entire set of since this is optional and this is optional and this is optional you could have an empty declaration too. So, this production implicitly allows the production d goes to epsilon ok right. So, um, now let us look at the statement which is s. So, a block just consists of a declaration followed by a statement. So, let us look at this this definition of statements. <coughs> so, a statement itself could be empty, a declaration could be empty which means the, an empty string itself is a program, but that need not worry you too much that is a sort of a trivial case, but a statement could be empty. Uh, otherwise, you have an assignment, an assignment statement is a statement where an assignment of course, is an identifier uh, colon equals uh, an expression. Note that there is absolutely no relation between what identifiers are declared in this declaration and what identifiers are used in the statement. So, the syntax is context free, but the language feature is such that you cannot use a variable without declaring it ok. So, that is something that is a context sensitive feature which is not specified in the syntax of the language yeah ok. So, then you have an explicit procedure call statement ok. So, you can call an identifier and the implicit meaning is that this identifier should have been declared as a procedure otherwise you cannot use call. Call is a reserved word. You have the one arm conditional which is if a condition then a statement. This whole thing is a single statement. You have the looping construct which is just as in Pascal and you have compound statements. You can coalesce a sequence of statements by bracketing them with a begin and end and call that a single statement. So, this just says that you can have a begin, you can have an s. Note that since s can produce an epsilon, this could also be empty ok then you can have 0 or more occurrences of this. So, for example, just a pair of brackets begin end itself is a statement it is what it is it is it is a trivial statement uh, uh, which does nothing ok it is it corresponds to a no operation for example, in hardware. So, you could have 0 or more repeti uh, occurrences of this grammatical entity and they are all separated by a semicolon right and this whole thing is a statement right. So, now we have uh, this this uh, our previous uh, our previous uh, uh, if you look at the only non terminals that are not really been defined here are i and n which I will define in the end, but all other non terminals here have been defined. But of course, they have also mean they, 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 they have also defined at the expense of introducing new non terminals ok. So, for example, expressions conditions these are some things that we have to define. So, a condition uh, well uh, 
the language is such that uh, I have modified the language a bit. Firstly, there is a unary condition <coughs> which for any expression E, uh, note that since the only data type available is integers, the only expressions available are also only integers. Okay. So, this unary data type applies over all expressions, uh, this unary condition, uh, this unary predicate applies over all, uh, over all expressions and yields a true or false. So, uh, this the reason for using this odd is well partly because well you it is nice to have a unary predicate, some unary predicate. Secondly, this also the reason for choosing odd is because there is a direct jump on not equals in most hardware. So, it so, wherever you have jump uh, wherever, uh, or even in your high level programs, a large number of your programs of the, are of the form while some variable is not equal to 0, do something. So, in all those cases you could check for oddness of that variable because the variable is also an expression as we will see and uh, you could use this as a condition. So, it is the other uh, otherwise you have various binary relational operators. Okay, uh, I have simplified the original language to a certain extent uh, by using single letter relational symbols. So, that is why you have these odd looking symbols. Okay. So, this, this is this is standard greater than, this is greater than or equals, this is equals, this is not equals. Uh, it is the original Pascal compiler for example, allowed this as a not equals symbol. Uh, this is less than and this is less than or equals. The original PL0 compiler as defined by Wirth actually assumed that the less than or equals and the greater than or equals symbols were already available on the keyboard, which they are not. Uh, so, I have had to change that. Uh, okay. So, conditions really depend upon expressions either through unary predicates or through binary predicates. And uh, let us look at the expression language. So, before I get into the expression language, I would like to say something. See, now uh, here in the case of the expression language, you have you have a compromise between two, diff two extremes. One is of course, that all of us think of expressions really in this form. Supposing you just consider the four operators that you have addition, subtraction, <coughs> multiplication, division. We normally think of an expression as being a sum of two expressions, a difference of two expressions, a product of two expressions or a quotient of two expressions and of course, we use brackets. However, what, what happens is that this is ambiguous. This grammar is ambiguous because for example, it does not use parenthesis sufficiently it is possible to generate sequences which you understand to have a certain priority order of evaluation and which if you define the expression language this way the compiler need not. Okay. So, it is ambiguous and of course, uh, every variable is an expression, every constant an integer constant is also an expression. Those are the atomic statements of this grammar. So, the other extreme is what we have already seen and that is that you fully bracket every expression. Whenever you have a binary operator, you put a bracket around the pair of operands. So, you can have E plus E enclosed in parenthesis, E minus E enclosed in parenthesis, E star E enclosed in parenthesis and E, div e enclosed in parenthesis. But however, most of us find it tedious to look at uh, to, to actually write parenthesis over everything I and mean, you will have to key, key in parenthesis every time. Whenever there is a binary operator, you would have to key in parenthesis. Okay. So, as far as we are concerned in our, abs in our abstract language, in our abstract syntax, we will just if we are looking at abstract syntax in string form, we will just assume them to be fully parenthesized. If you are looking at abstract syntax as tr in tree form, we will just draw the trees corresponding to whatever order of evaluations you want, we want. 
okay because any fully parenthesized notation can be translated into an appropriate abstract tree which preserves the order of evaluation of the expressions and vice versa. Given any abstract syntax tree, you can transform that into a fully bracketed string of symbols, okay. But from the point of view of a compiler, this because it is ambiguous is clearly unacceptable. This because it is tedious for every programmer to write fully parenthesized <coughs> versions makes it, uh, makes it inconvenient. So what, what one has to do is that, uh, uh, what one has to do is that one has to strike a reasonable compromise and try to define the expression language in such a way that it is not ambiguous, it is not tedious and it follows all the conventions of, uh, uh, so follows all the uh, normal conventions of mathematical notation, yeah, right. Uh, in passing let me mention that uh, uh, this, 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 this plus and minus are also overloaded unary operators. For example, you can take negative numbers or you can write positive numbers as plus something right. So then they become unary operators okay. So a negative number is just the unary minus of a non-negative integer okay. So it is a unary operator there whereas when it occurs in such a form it is a bi this, this plus and minus are binary operators okay. So we have to take that into account too there is overloading and we, have al we always in our mathematics too we have used a lot of overloading. For example, in our programming too, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, multipli and multiplication are used for, for wo over both real data types and over integer data types. In the Pascal language, they are also used for set operations, okay. So they are overloaded tremendously uh, and this overloading is something that one should take care of. Um, so, so the normal conventions that we that we follow are that unary operators usually bind the tightest. Okay, that means the, a unary operator its influence extends over to the first available symbol, and that's it. And it takes precedence over everything else, over all other operators, except when there are parentheses. <coughs> Okay. So, if you have a unary operator and, an, and a large expression enclosed in parenthesis, then it is the negation of that entire expression and not of the first symbol after the expression, uh, after the left parenthesis, okay, right. And plus and minus are of course overloaded and uh, the normal mathematical convention is that uh, multiplication and division bind tighter than the binary operators plus and minus. Okay. However, multiplication and division lose precedence over the unary operators plus and minus. So if you have, if, so if you have for example, minus 5, if you have an unparenthesized expression of this form, minus 5 star minus 3, then uh, or minus 5 star 3 then what you mean is that this minus refers to this 5 and not to the entire expression. This minus refers to this 3 and this star binds these two. So the appropriate bracketing is this, right. So uh, we have to, we have to take these conventions into account for the purpose of Allah, for giving a friendly user interface as far as the expression language is concerned. So that people with a normal knowledge of mathematics, mathematical notation, mathematical conventions can write programs, can write expressions that they, they have normally been trained to write, right. So, so let us look at the expression language. So what happens is that this, the provision of this convenience mean, mean, means that you require a more, uh, you require a, a, a fairly large number of non-terminals before you can 
expect to define it unambiguously, right? So, here it is. Uh, this, this, this language of expressions is available in all books which somehow or the other deal with parsing or compiling or anything. So, I won't, uh, I won't go into great details about how it is unambiguous and how they have taken into account all the conventions, but you can see it at a glance that it will work, right? So, an expression is a term which might be preceded by a unary plus or minus or since this is an optional clause, it may not even be preceded by any of these, okay? So, it might be an unsigned term if you like followed by optionally an addition operator and a term, okay? Right. The addition operators are just the binary plus and minus. So, uh, please disregard this. Okay, so, any expression can be regarded either as a term, a signed or an unsigned term or a signed or, un or an unsigned term with an addition uh, followed by an addition operator and another term. A term It, uh, a term is something which is either a either a factor which we will worry about later or it is a product of two factors or the quotient of two factors. So, this m is a multiplicative operator. So, star and uh, division the mu multiplication and division are multiplicative operators and a term is something that of this form either it is a factor or it is product or quotient of two factors, right? Uh, a factor is anything regarded as a single unit, either it is an identifier which means that we are normally talking about variables or constants or it is actually a number specified as part of the expression or it is a whole expression in itself enclosed in parenthesis. So, you can see that these terms that these three non terminals E, T and F are mutually recursive because uh, E is defined in terms of T, T is defined in terms of F, F is again de defined in terms of E. So, they are mutually and circularly non recursive are uh, circularly recursive and uh, they actually uh, take into account the fact that you can look upon, uh, so if you can look upon a, an expression as basically the sum of two things. So, you do not expand out into a term. Uh, so, so if you have the, if you have that the, the outermost operation that is to be done is an, is an addition operation, okay. You have some large expression whose root operation is an addition operation. That means, that is the last operation to be done then your context free grammar generation is such that the left upper end supposing it is just an identifier. So, it will your productions will allow it to go from E to T then from T to F, F to I, uh, F to E again or F to I and from I again it will it will keep circularly revolving. Yeah? Okay. So, we will, uh, so, th so this grammar really takes precedence of operators into account and, uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 prob the point is that this, this syntactical definition is absolutely essential for writing the compiler. So, for pragmatic reasons it is necessary to have this kind of a syntactic definition, but semantically we will just look upon an expression as a signed or an unsigned expression or something that is a binary operator just in terms of abstract trees. So, we will either look at it if you want to rep represent them linearly either as fully parenthesized expressions or 
as abstract syntax trees. Yeah, so, so uh, lastly, let us come to the last part, which is uh, the definition of a number. So, a number is either a signed or an unsigned integer. So, this is an optional clause and the definition is that it can have a digit, that it should have a digit followed by more digits. Okay. And uh, a digit of course is defined as a character 0 to 9. Right. So, an identifier, we follow normal Pascal rules, an identifier should start with a letter. In the case of the PL0 compiler, all uh, the alphabet uh, consists of only uppercase letters. It is very trivial to modify it to include lowercase letters too. But what really distinguishes a number from an identifier is the occurrence of a letter or a plus or minus symbol or a digit. That is what really distinguishes that. Okay. So, the occurrence of a letter, this plus or minus really is an operation. It is not, uh, it is not really, I mean you are actually going to take, if you have a negative number, you are actually going to take the corresponding integer and negate it as an operation, right. Okay. So, in the case of an identifier, that is why it should begin with a letter and uh, it may be followed by one or more letters or digits, right. And the reason for, for removing this n and i productions from the main grammar is that this, these rules are really not part of parsing. I mean they are, they are part of what is known as a lexical analysis. Okay. For example, you can write such rules also for recognizing that the word while w h i l e has been recognized as a single word. The word begin has been recognized as a single word. So, these are actually part of the process of what is known as scanning okay, or lexical analysis. So, uh, typically if you look at a program written in this language, it just consists of, it is a file of characters and we would, we would like to divide up the program into words or what are known as lexemes or you uh, which which really describe each entity in the in the program so instead of a file of characters we would like to regard it as a file of words and how are you going to regard it as a file of words you should be able to recognize all the reserved words you should scan all the words and decide whether they are reserved words or if they are not reserved words you should be able to treat them as identifiers okay or if they are constants you should be able to read out the entire constant in this case for example a string of digits representing an integer or a uh, or a string of or a plus or minus followed by a string of digits representing an integer so then you would look at the entire thing as a single unit so a scanner typically takes a file of characters and gives you a file of words or actually what they are known as so you have the pro the user program is just a file of characters and what you get is a file of lexemes. Yeah? Uh, the word file is used in a very general fa uh, fashion, I mean it does not mean a disk file, it means any unbounded sequence, ordered sequence of objects. Yeah? So, the process of scanning converts a file of characters into a file of lexemes and then the process of parsing actually takes over 
the handling. So that's one reason why I have not, I have not worried too much about, uh, for example, these reserved words. So I'm, I'm. What I'm saying is the process of scanning would have created a single lexeme out of all these. All these things are a single unit. Yeah, and they would, they will, after scanning, they would lose the status of being a string of characters. There would be some single unit in the form of some structured, uh, 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 an element of some structured data type, which gives the identification as to what this unit is. Okay, so it could be an index into a table which says that and with other details like it is a reserved word or it is an identifier or it is a constant, it is type in a more complicated language whether it is an integer type or so on will be filled in later maybe after the area of after the, uh, after the process of parsing and uh, so on is through. So you will actually create a huge table of the amount of information that you have to abs extract from the program through all the process of compiling and keep it for use for checking for example, type checking, runtime type checks, compile time type checks to detect undeclared variables, which is also a good way of detecting spelling mistakes, right. So, so all these terminal symbols will actually become single units in some table and they, the, the, the file of lexemes will just be a single unit which gives an index into the table. Okay, so that, that table is resident always in memory for reference during the process of compiling. For example, you have to check various context sensitive uh, issues like has it been declared before, right? If it has been declared, what is the type? Is it being assigned the right type? Is it being used in an expression of the right type? So you require this table of information for each identifier, reserved word or each lexeme to know whether it is being used correctly in the program, right. So this is the syntax of the language uh, and uh, we will get on in future to defining the semantics of the language. Okay. So we will start uh, the next lecture with the basic notions of semantics. And uh, and we will we will then add on to this toy language new features and see how they have to be defined. The syntactic definitions of these new features is not very critical because you you have all the basic material. As long as you can parenthesize expressions, uh, as long as you can parenthesize the new features that you're um, that you're introducing without ambiguity or as long as you can define them in some reasonably good syntax, it is not very important how they look. It is more important how the abstract syntax trees look and what meaning you give to the abstract syntax trees. Yeah, thank you.